uh, I want to introduce you to our first speaker. We are so honored that she accepted to be uh, with us to open uh, Tax Club today. Um, this is Kimberly Clausing. Uh, Kimberly is the uh, Deputy Assistant Secretary Office of Tax Policy, U.S. Department of the Treasury. Uh, she's also a professor of tax law and tax policy at UCLA. Um, I would say that, you know, if I would choose uh, one, one job that I would like to do uh, internationally, presently, it's probably the job of um, Kimberly Clausing. She's, she's, you know, she has been doing so much with the, uh, for the, uh, the international tax reform uh, uh, with the uh, U.S. government. Uh, Kimberly also um, accepted to uh, to be in uh, the movie uh, Fast and Dangerous Race to the Bottom. She was at Tax Co op 2020. She has a, a very, very busy schedule and she accepted to be with us today. So thank you so much, Kimberly. Um, please, uh, uh, we are waiting uh, to hear you today. Hello, and, and thanks so much for that kind introduction and the invitation to speak today. This, organi this organization has done such enormously important work to further tax cooperation, and I'm honored to be able to uh, speak with you today. Uh, so currently I am at the U.S. Treasury, and uh, I should caution that these remarks are just really intended to review, to reflect my views as a scholar who's worked in this area for now about three decades and not necessarily the views of the treasury, but I hope this audience well knows that the US treasury is of course an enthusiastic supporter of international tax cooperation. Okay, so let me get to the heart of the question that I was asked to talk about today, um, which is in particular to describe the challenges of tax cooperation in the 21st century and how government organizations can contribute to addressing those challenges. And these are really essential questions. And, and frankly, uh, to be honest, the challenges of tax cooperation are, are truly quite daunting. Um, so I'm gonna describe three of them and how they've made the road really quite difficult for many years. And then I'll end on a more optimistic note uh, describing the progress the governments have made over, over the prior year. Um, so the challenges of tax cooperation, um, I, I think, begin with this first one. Um, we live in a world where capital is much more mobile than labor. This is true not just for physical capital, you know, machines and buildings, and the debt and equity markets that finance that physical capital, but it's also true of the tax base itself, which is far more mobile than the underlying investment. In contrast, if you look at workers, labor is relatively immobile. The vast, vast majority of people and workers are born, work, and die all in the same tax jurisdiction. Workers do not arrange their financial lives to book their wages offshore. So governments are well aware of this distinction between the mobility of capital and labor, and corporate taxpayers themselves assist in heightening this awareness. Uh, they speak incessantly about the competitiveness effects of any slight disadvantage that their country's tax laws might provide relative to those in a friendlier jurisdiction. While financial profits are easier to move offshore than real economic activity, government actors are quite fearful of losing both tax base and of losing jobs, and therefore they often rush to provide a favorable tax climate. As a result, since the 19 in the 80s, we've seen a steady reduction in corporate tax rates really around the world. Um, and all at the same time, we've seen a rising share of capital in, in income, both in the United States and in many other countries. And we've seen rising corporate profits uh, in most jurisdictions around the world. So this itself is the race to the bottom that you described in your movie. And it's a powerful force encouraging governments uh, that want a robust tax base to instead tax the less mobile sources of income, such as labor or its close cousin consumption. So, so that's one really big challenge here. Capital is just more mobile than labor in a global economy. A second big challenge comes from the secular trends we've seen in the larger world economy that have resulted in increased economic inequality alongside this rising capital share and income and rising corporate profits. This trend towards increased inequality, by the way, even holds for labor income, which is more and more concentrated at the top 
in many countries, not in every country, but in many countries. Scholars disagree about the extent to which inequality has increased, and they disagree about the precise attribution of the causal forces that drive that inequality. But the inequality itself and its increase is undeniable, both in the United States and in the larger world. And this inequality is troubling across many axes. Of course, the inequality itself leaves many in the lower parts of the distribution feeling left out and discontent. In the United States, low wage growth over the prior decades has at times exacerbated this discontent, leading to a situation where those at the bottom, um, half of the distribution really, have seen relatively disappointing economic outcomes. And these disappointing, uh, these disappointed expectations have fueled political discontent, and the academic literature has actually shown that economic shocks can also fuel political polarization, which is certainly a palpable problem in both the United States and abroad. So beyond that problem, a concentration of economic resources also leads to a concentration of political power and has its own influence on the economic policies that are possible. Economic interests of those at the top are often well represented, not just by well-paid lobbyists, but by uh, the sorts of informal social networks that elites occupy. And that stands in large contrast with the economic interests of those at the bottom, which are less well represented. And that fact presents another important challenge for international tax cooperation. Elite interests will often find they have more sway than those of the general public. And that's why you know, groups like yourself are, are particularly uh, important. The third challenge is that international tax cooperation must confront the rising economic nationalism that too often has led countries to seek advantage as if every game was zero sum. Um, and there are many areas, not just in tax cooperation, but also if you think about climate change mitigation or international trade, where countries would actually seek much better and achieve much better joint outcomes through cooperation than they would through competition. This avoids the classic prisoner's dilemma, whereby countries pursuing their own self-interest end up with the worst equilibrium for all countries relative to what could have been attained through cooperation. Economic nationalism has been a rising and dangerous force, and it's too easy to embrace. And it's all the more easy to embrace in this context of increased economic inequality because the gains from economic growth are not always felt by many in society. But economic nationalism itself is wrongheaded and more likely to add insult to injury for those who are left behind. In the area of international tax, countries competing to attract this mobile tax base have often um, re resorted to very low, ta low tax rates and low tax burdens on the excess profits of the world's most profitable corporations. And the benefits of that light taxation don't accrue in a shared manner. Uh, instead, they are disproportionately help those at the top, which just fuels the economic inequality and the troubling discontent that comes with it. So, so those are all really daunting challenges, right? The inequalities in nationalism and the mobility of capital. Um, but this brings me to the more optimistic part of these opening remarks, which is that government organizations can contribute in a meaningful way to resolving these problems alongside you know, the private and public and nonprofit actors like yourselves. Um, and it's through this cooperation that we can counter, you know, these harmful uh, problems that I just described. So the good news is over the past year, governments from around the world have made enormous progress. 137 countries have committed to end the race to the bottom, achieving a minimum level of taxation on the mobile profits of multinational companies and assuring a fair allocation of taxing rights and handling the vexing issues that uh, surround that problem. This represents really a, a stunning achievement, um, achieving what many have called the most significant economic agreement of, of the entire century so far. So why is this such an important agreement? And I, I would argue in fact that the obstacles that I just described are part of what makes this an important moment. Um, first, this agreement demonstrates that countries can cooperate to solve important collective action problems and achieve better outcomes together than they would have if they just uh, went alone. And this is a particularly important moment to demonstrate the merits of cooperation since the world is facing enormous collective action problems in other areas. Um, two that lead to mind, of course, are climate change, which is an existential threat 
uh, but also the deeply troubling problems of our present pandemic. And these are both areas that require longstanding and robust cooperation for success. Um, but that kind of longstanding and robust cooperation will be much easier to build in the context of uh, successful trust and cooperation like that has been achieved in this agreement. Um, so I, I view this as an important moment for building uh, trust among countries. Uh, second, this agreement demonstrates that international economic agreements can serve the interests of the middle class, uh, of workers, and not just elites. Um, by facilitating the taxation of mobile capital, the agreement makes it easier for countries throughout the world to push for fair tax systems at home. And in the context of increasing economic inequality, it is important to push forward international rules that can create a global economy that works for workers and that works for the middle class. This allows us all to benefit from the enormous gains from trade, immigration, and the free flow of capital while still supporting inclusive economic growth at home, um, which is best done with a fairer tax system. And this agreement is really an important step in that direction. It's not, of course, the final step, but it's an important initial step. Um, that's not to say that there aren't important headwinds here. The, the political headwinds against this type of progress are gonna continue to blow strongly but with the efforts of the public sector, the nonprofit sector, and private actors behind them, uh, alongside the cooperation among the governments themselves, we have the potential here to make enormous progress. And I'm really quite encouraged by the developments over the past year. So uh, thank you so much again for, for all of your work um, in this area and for inviting me to, to address your, your group today. Thank you so much, so very much, Kimberly Crossing. This, uh, I, I took note of everything you were saying, and uh, I felt that uh, we, uh, it, it's, it's very inspiring, very precious uh, uh, remarks, and uh, thank you for sharing your thoughts. Uh, you are at the center of, you know, uh, of negotiation, international negotiations. So uh, we know that. Uh, what uh, the way you feel about the situation is very important. And, uh, you know, the issues of inequality, nationalism, and mobility of capital is so well explained. Thank you so much.